it, it didn't. It didn't. Um, so after after coming to terms that I hadn't just wasted five years uh, of my life, I managed to maintain the conservation title, but I swapped marine for terrestrial and I came, became a terrestrial conservationist. So feet on the ground is where I like to find myself. Um, so I completed a three month course in uh, Africa, which was a field guiding program. So it was basically like a degree in 12 weeks. And I remember about a month in and I was talking to the lead guide, who's this walking encyclopedia of knowledge. He says, Ian, you, your passion and enthusiasm for, for species is it, it's amazing but i've got to tell you it's if you don't love or appreciate the soils then well quite frankly we're all buggered you know it's the ecosystems that we need to maintain and i was thinking that i haven't traveled halfway around the world to look at your soils and fast forward 13 14 years um i'm here at nature metrics under the uk conservation team spending at least 50 percent of my time looking and discussing soils um but it's from here that i think that we can really make a difference we can create change and like yourselves in terms of your backgrounds um and your career aspirations what you've done where you're going i mean we all got idols my idols like some vattenborough marshall tim virgin on frisk lorenz and recently tree sheldrake um and but the point is is that we're shaped by the people who we aspire to be and ultimately we are all on this call because we have a connection with nature sharing biophilia which leads nicely on on to the next point ultimately which is biodiversity now i think it's important to try and start this talk off um that i think it was april this year biodiversity was ranked as a top global risk in terms of likelihood and impact and I think it's organisations like you, individuals like you, and organisations like us that choose to do something about it. Now, I know we could all go on and on and have a really cool webinar about why you got into nature, why you like nature, why you like fractal lines. But I thought it's a really good moment to try and grasp and remember that throughout this talk and then the reason why and how we can push forward. Um, we do a lot of work with uh, United Nations and one being United Nations Environmental Programme and Inga Anderson, who's a, a force to be reckoned with, stated that we haven't truly understood um, the value of nature and stock of natural capital has declined, I think with about 40% whilst produced capital is increasing, yet nearly a million species are facing extinction, so there's something inherently wrong there. Um, so nature has an infinite value, and just because we make um, our quarterly returns on cutting down mangroves and rainforests doesn't necessarily make it right, and it certainly doesn't make it right. And I come from a crop of beliefs and thinking systems of critical thinking and asking questions why, but I think life is about long-term connected happiness with nature, not about short-term gains that, that work against it. Um, I think that then leads nicely on to the fact that ultimately, how can we conserve nature, species, protect habitats if we don't know what's there in the first place? It's, it's you simply can't do it. And I think that's nicely where eDNA comes in and nature metrics as a whole. So Kat Bruce, who founded Nature Metrics back in 2015. Dean, I want to say, um, completed a PhD in the Amazon. She knew uh, that eDNA was up and coming. And instead of morphologically IDing all of the uh, species that she was running for a PhD, a professor said, hey, try this. A very long story short, and I'm making it very unromantic, um, but she realized the application was, was huge and the upside scale potential was massive to create unprecedented levels of data. So, Fast forwarding five years, we became very proficient in uh, GCN, so Great Crested Newts, and it sort of branched out from there, starting from rivers and waters, down to marine extractives, mining, um, and so on and so forth, and obviously the greatest department within Nature Metrics Conservation Team. Um, so originally, there was no service tying um, the academic sector to the people on the ground, and I think basically we, we put this tool in the hands of the practitioners, the conservationists, the landowners, the farmers, the protected area managers, the impact assessors. And once you do that, you bring that gap 
together between molecular scientists and the environmental scientists. And then I'd like to talk about that word environmental scientists later, um, because citizen science has such a part to play. And when I, I lectured for four years and we did something where we brought the families and their families, friends around some heathland we were looking at in, uh, down in Guildford, Walkerston. And once we got the whole community together, we actually made real head where we brought the council in and we, we created some change. So citizen science, environmental scientists, molecular scientists, we're all wanting the same thing. We're just at certain levels, but together we can collaborate and understand biodiversity as a holistic approach to save well, species and threatened habitats. But as you can see here, obviously we can understand the challenge. Um, the new tools identified back in 2015 in terms of how CAT could use this to augment data, complement data, and provide large scales of data to help people understand what is there and what could we do about it. So a little bit of background about me and then a little bit of an intro regarding nature metrics. So, what I thought would be a good idea is to sort of take you on a little bit of a journey of who Nature Metrics are, what, what we do, and then a bit of a more of an in-depth look at eDNA, its application, and some success stories, some trials, limitations, and you know, no one really likes hearing a story of how someone was just gifted everything in life and their, their life was wonderful and brilliant and long, long live that happy ever after. Things are hard and we want something that's difficult. Um, like in conservation, I used to teach students. It, it's true conservation, it's hard, it's repetitive, it's predominantly sweaty um, and repeat. And, you know, it's not about having a photograph taken of a particular species, it, it's everything in between that. And it's the appreciation of an ant lion to a lion or a rhino beetle to a rhino and everything in between, and all the interconnectedness. So I'm going to monologue about that. So I better get back uh, to the actual storyboard here. But um, in terms of nature metrics, we've been I think, commercially viable and operating now since 2016. And as you can see here, we've grown quite considerably. I think I was staff member number 67. I've been with nature metrics for approaching my fourth month now. So yeah, I think I was number 67 in that list, but we're growing and growing. I think out of the 80 staff members, we've got about 36, 36, 35, 36 PhDs. Um, so some very competent people within, within the team here. Um, we obviously work within the UK, and my focus is within the UK, but in terms of other work and outside of the UK, you can see here we've branched out quite nicely and coincide um, nicely biodiversity hotspots and fastest rate of development. But we work with a range of clients from large organisations to NGOs, consultancies, people who want to know what's in their pond, landowners, farmers, and understand the difference between the private sector and consultancies. And ecological consultancies in terms of rewilding are so paramount in terms of moving that, that focus forward in terms of restoration and rewilding. And for us, it's about augmenting the data for endangered species and monitoring species for key sites that are being monitored for impact valuation studies, critical habitat, uh, habitat assessments, you know, the key stages of a project that are being earmarked for protection. That's ultimately where we, where we're sitting. But what do we do? We, what do we want to do? We, we like and want to turn nature into data. And from this point, we're capturing biodiversity data at a previously unthinkable scale. And from those simple water samples or soil samples, we can generate the knowledge base that can underpin effective action for the protection and ultimately restoration of nature. And I don't think anything is more important. I mean, we, nature doesn't need us, but, but we need it. Um, yeah, I think it's a really powerful statement that is that we we need nature it doesn't need us um, I was reading a really beautiful book recently and I think for every three three humans that have been born we're losing species at like a five percent rate every time in terms of the collective from insects and um, microbes and bacteria everything just seems to be diminishing and what we're, we're wanting to look at is creating metrics to move forward that's accessible over time, but I'll, I'll come on to that. Um, but in terms of what do we actually, the fun stuff, what do we actually um, analyze, look for, detect? So anything from bacteria to blue whales, from pygmy hippos to 
pangolins. Um, there's lots of exciting charismatic species, but at the same time, we get really important data. But I think the big question is how? How do we do this? Where do we start? Um, and the big question is, is that eDNA stands for environmental DNA. So it's all the traces from these species, from crayfish to otters, water voles, mink. It's everything that they leave behind. And here I think it's essential that, that we're referring to the traces of the DNA. So fur, mucus, saliva, blood, urine, anything that's left behind. This can be pick up, picked up, amplified, sequenced, and then put through a high throughput machine, and then we can sequence it in terms of identifying by a taxonomic tree. But there's considerations with environmental DNA, and in regards to some of the, oh, let's say, difficulties, you've got variables to consider, i.e., I mentioned water voles. You can't just say, yes, we'll detect water voles every month of the year. I mean, we can, but it's a little bit easier, I think, in terms of um, surveying practice, it's, I think it's best times is between June and August or April to October. October is, is survey time, but I think June to August is the best time. So if you're doing it out of that, it can be a little bit more difficult to detect. Um, other considerations are things like um, low metabolic rates. So amphibians, for example, reptiles, they're notoriously quite difficult to detect. If you have a low metabolic rate, you don't shed as, uh, as much. Um, as you would do mammals and other vertebrates. Um, beavers, for example, they're quite easy to detect um, as they spend a lot of the time in water, the latrines in the water. But otters and mink, again, can be quite notoriously difficult and latrines are outside the water. And I think I was reading a paper um, a month ago and I think it's, it stated that, let me get this right, sorry, that their dense fur also prevents much of the eDNA release in the way of skin cells and hair shedding, basically. So again, another obstacle to, work, to overcome. But the beauty about wanting to preserve anything from in your back garden to an estate to a rewilding project, it's understanding those questions. And what I think that I, I've done in life, and I think that we do beautifully, and one of the considerations you need to do when considering rewilding is asking as many questions as physically possible at the start, and we will do the same. Um, and I found that once you start to understand the short-term aim and comprise of the mid and then the long-term aim, you have a complete package because rewilding restoration doesn't necessarily, give me a bit of rope here, have an end goal like a, another project would. It's not necessarily run, run the same way. Um, so there's considerations that need to be applied there. But ultimately, environmental uh, DNA is eDNA, um, and that encapsulates everything that I've mentioned before from feces, hair, and everything in between that can be tracked um, and um, detected in the filter kit. Um, which I do have in front of me, but I think my video is slightly off. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, in regards to eDNA, it only remains um, in the water for a few days, but this is good news actually, because we're never capturing historical traces. So nothing really passed a week. So we're capturing present and current data. And this really gives a high temporal resolution of, of what is out there. So here, the beauty of eDNA metabolic coding is, is the ease with which a sample can be collected. You filter the water, you're basically pushing a syringe through a kit. Um, and once it gets really, really tough, you stop, you preserve it, you put your cap on, you record some data, and you send it back to us. It's as simple as that. Um, so very, very easy. And each sample kit can be, I think, completed in about 15 to 20 minutes, 20 minutes being generous. It's so simple and very, very, uh, non-invasive. Um, the beautiful thing about it is that the actual uh, disc is maintained within the, the plastic segment of, uh, of the kit, so it's very difficult to contaminate with your, with your own DNA or the other DNA for that matter. Um, other positives is that it's very easy to collect, there's no cold storage required with water, water sampling, um, no batteries, no pumps, uh, there's no heavy equipment, and the DNA basically just gets stuck in that filter, 
Um, and from here, you can run anything from four up to a maximum of four groups per kit. So amphibians, reptiles, fish, vertebrates, mammals, etc. cetera. Um, but which analysis and, and where? So you've got water kits, you've got soil and sediment, and you've got bulk invertebrates. Now, as mentioned, animal shed, DNA. Um, but from here, we need to try and extrapolate what's the best process in terms of the variables that are applicable. So water, in terms of uh, residency times, sort of degrades between hours and days, but hours in soil, the residency time is sort of weeks, weeks and months. So there's different factors consider. Soil has a different parameter where we require it to be frozen, whereas water, water's not. Um, but there's two, two, two main points which I'm going to come on to. And in terms of analysis, in terms of looking at your land and which way you want to go, whether it's QPCR or whether it's metabarcoding, QPCR is, is single species and metabarcoding, so MBC, this looks at um, multiple species and this is applied to all of those there. Now, in regards to bulk inverts, so I've had an upbringing where I was never really allowed to say you could kill uh, two birds with one stone. I'm more of the ethos of uh, feeding two birds with one hand. Um, so yeah, bulk inverts and invertebrates obviously does require mushing up into a soup um, and obviously ethanol applied there. However, the results that do come from it are pretty profounding and pretty powerful. Um, so obviously the arguments in regards to your restoration project and then which procedure that you think best suits um, your habitat and your land. Here again, a little bit further breakdown in terms of where we're looking at, but focus I would say in terms of wildlife restoration, in terms of rewilding, the majority here is sat in the middle in terms of soils. So soil fauna, bacteria and fungi, which I'm gonna come on to um, shortly. Further split here, just so people can understand this single species and this multi-species. So single species is normally in five to 10 days of um, analysis time and then multi-species, so MBC is normally eight weeks. And the MBC is normally medium to high sensitivity um, and where a single species is very, it's highly sensitive. Um, and I think that's one of the main applicants um, applications there. And I think in regards to R&D at the moment, I can't go into too much detail in terms of the assays that have been developed, but I think we've got assay development that matches 60% of the number of different species that you see there. So there's lots going on all of the time. Um, we can also collect um, DNA for species from feces, and that allows us to um, really interpret the dietary uh, assessments too. But for rewilding, the water kits, I think, complement um, the approach. But to date, in the past four months that I've been sat on and running projects, um, it's 80% soil analysis, looking at um, bacteria and fungi ratios and, and soil fauna. Um, but yeah, as mentioned, two points here. One is species X present, so single species. And the other one is called community analysis, which is NBC. So species are present from a taxonomic group. A very nice, tidy way of getting lots of biodiversity data, basically. But the, the less charismatic the species, the less chance of it being in the reference database. And what have we done to it? The thing that I absolutely love, and going back to my lecturing days and working with NGOs, I'm very fortunate to have traveled to, I think, I think I've literally I've hit the 5-0, not in terms of age, in terms of countries. I've traveled to 50 countries. And whenever you're working with locals um, from a local's perspective, you're able to democratize data, you're able to have a far greater investment in terms of the output. People, without speaking to simply, they just care more and they want to be involved. And when you involve people who it's directly affecting, the output and the outcome is far better received and it's, it, it's far more tangible. Um, so here we've got the power of data and the thing that I do fall in love with is, is that democratizing it. My 10 year old daughter can collect an eDNA sample. It, it's, it's that easy. Uh, Kat Bruce, the founder, she did a test about three years ago with her niece and some of her friends and using water kits, they all collected um, water in, sorry, samples in the same lake. They sent them all off and 
they were all perfectly matched cats. They didn't take them at the same uh, sites, but in terms of validity, it's replicable um, and it's valid. So democratizing something that has the power to sequence data to this level, I think is a, a genius move to allow people to, to get involved on, on large footings. In terms of uh, reporting, I don't get me wrong, I'm not gonna start going into stats. I'm, I'm not a statistician. But if you can sort of try to have a little look um, at this reporting table, I won't go through each one of these in, in its quite so fine detail, but I think in the threat and status column is quite an important measure because everything that we uh, put together by the sample table, we're able to um, identify with the IUCN red list. And that gives you more information in terms of what you've got. In, in regards to your habitat. You can see the far end there, S1, 2, 3, and 4, they're just sample 1, 2, 3, and 4. When you've got the numbers, you've got, you've got the species that's present. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite simple. Um, so here, this is something that we, we offer in terms of data that's collected. So simple taxon by sample table, simple bubble plot. So the bigger the bubble or the, more, the, the, the bubble that we've got there identifies um, presence of particular species. So the proportion of the sequencing output allocated to the different taxa the rows, for example, within each sample columns, each bubble represents the proportion of DNA for each taxon for that sample. So the size of the bubble is relative to the number of sequences for the taxa in that sample. So again, really simply, nicely uh, laid out. And then it starts to get a little bit, whoa. So here we've got uh, comparative uh, taxonomic heat trees. So showing the number of OTUs for habitat A versus habitat B. Um, a molecular ecologist's uh, very, uh, I wouldn't say best friend, but good friend here in terms of collecting data and showing large volumes of data um, at scale. And then we've got NMDS plot. So this is just a fourth and final way in terms of how we can present data in a comparative uh, style from habitat A to habitat B and looking at the crossovers um, in between the two. So this might indicate, for example, a clear and effective pond management. And when monitored over time, the effects of, of long-term management, e.g. treatments or habitat restoration, it can be measured as sites become more or less similar to each other. So this is a really good way to track something over time. Limitations and advantages. Um, my mother taught me to be honest, if not anything. And I think that's what I like about, about data. You can't hide from data. It is what it is. Um, but I think in regards to limitations, I remember sitting into a conversation about um, comparison electrofishing. And um, no, it's not, it's not here to replace electrofishing. It's here to complement and augment data. Um, there's things that eDNA can't do, for example, let's say electrofishing could. Um, it couldn't, can't give you the age. Or it can't provide health checks. Um, but the kits you can fit into your bag and weigh less than a kilogram. They're very, very light. Um, you can collect large data sets for NPI and restoration monitoring. It's a huge reduced cost and health and safety risk is certainly reduced here. Um, works in all types of water. And at the moment, our soil application is, well, when I first started, I noticed that about 20% of my working day was working with soils and restoration projects. I would now say it's completely flipped and about 80% of my day is working with uh, soils and restoration projects. And the beautiful thing about the advantage is it can be used by anybody. I mentioned before, it's been democratized. The methods are non-invasive. It can detect cryptic and elusive species. And it's one of the things that quite a lot of people don't, don't know is that there's no need to visit the sample site to add analysis. And we keep the sample for up to a year. So if you run analysis on um, your rewilding project and you just wanted to look at fungal and bacteria ratios, and then six months down the line, something happens where you wanted to add another category or a bit of extra budget's been released because we've got to appease the God of statistics, but also appease uh, the budget line. You don't need to go to do any more samples. We've got the sample already. We can just run another analysis and and, a, and away we go, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. Um, one of the things that I think is also, um, that comes up quite often, is that abundance uh, can be tricky uh, to gain from eDNA. I mean, we can use relative abundance as a proxy for occupancy and occurrence with a landscape if we have a good enough uh, sampling strategy that can be repeated in time. 
Um, but I think ultimately that can then look at changes in presence and absence across the landscape. It's, it's difficult to infer population size though. Okay, so some examples. So like the, the juicy bits, I'm gonna come on well, Amazon in Africa is one of my favorite places, but I'm going to start with the UK because it is a beautiful place. And I think if you don't know enough about the species within the UK and the amazing um, successful restoration and rewilding projects here, then you can't look further afield just yet. Um, so there's some companies' names that are, we are allowed to, to share, others, others we can't, so I hope you understand that. Um, but here, this is the uh, data set from 40 samples collected from Ornamental Lakes at National Trust Properties. Um, and given, it gave us 74 uh, vertebrate species, including water voles and otters, and a whole range of small mammals, birds, as well as amphibians and fish. Another program here, we're also able to detect several important invasive species, as well as lots of native pea mussels and clams, and there's still DNA left over, which I was mentioning before. So if they wanted to know about crayfish or freshwater macro invertebrates, we can run those samples um, that we already have without having to do any more field work. So I think I mentioned, yeah, we install the DNA for, uh, for up to a year, and then the samples can be analyzed for additional taxa at a, at a later date. This is a really good uh, case study. So this was with uh, Jacobs and they're comparing all three sites, so natural woodland, plantation woodland and unwooded pasture. And here the analysis was based on fungi, bacteria and soil fauna. And here, um, EDNA in the water, as I wanted to mention, it degrades in terms of hours to days, whereas the residency time, I think I mentioned uh, for soils, it's weeks to months. Um, so that's a consideration that we need to, need to apply here. And currently we're working on fungal and bacteria ratios and aid and assist assessments for regenerative farming uh, practices. But ultimately, if fungal networks, fungal networks develop, then, then we have a win. To get an index of flow of nutrients, of soil, bacteria and fungi, they're, they're good indicators. And a high percentage of bacteria is, is associated with this more arable land. And it's good as using that as a, as a, as a baseline. So, Ultimately, what we do is we, we create as a comprehensive baseline as we possibly can do. So there's always that age old saying of you, you, you buy cheap, you end up buying twice. So we much prefer to work with yourselves and understand, I think it's a good practice in life, really. Um, I bought an expensive bag for my travels 10 years ago and I've still got it. It cost about 170 pounds, but I've still got it 10 years on. Um, so, that's ultimately where, where we want to sit with, the, with these procedures. And I think this case study is a really, really exciting one. And we produce these types of outputs. So heat trees, so i.e. a number of species in each taxonomic group or level that we can get to. So the less charismatic the species, the less chance it has of being in one of the reference data, databases. But also we can display the data in something called non-metric multidimensional scaling, a little bit of a mouthful or NMDS plots, which is a clustering of samples to show difference. Snapshot in time here, but going back to show changes over time, there's an aspiration to assess if the plantation woodland is having an impact upon it or being changed or the unwooded area is being changed to see a trajectory towards the natural habitat. But that's very much to just working with the species data uh, that, that we get. But there's move on and very healthy move on in terms of where, where we're looking forward to sitting. So the way that we are, are heading, we have a, this BI team, a business intelligence team um, was set up, I think, in March this year. March, I say February this year. I might get shot for some of the things I'm saying here. So I think, oh, let's go with March this year. There's a business intelligence team that was set up. And this is to be able to monitor progress in restoring ecosystems to achieve biodiversity targets. So here we're, we're looking at developing health metrics to show progress. So from degraded, to healthy. We're moving towards to measuring changes in soil biomass and composition or metrics that can measure soil restoration progress and take a baseline and in two years compare that back to where you were. And one of the things I mentioned earlier is about asking lots of questions and looking at the aims, not just short term, short, mid and long term. So we come back in five years and 10 years and, and that's ultimately the package. Rewilding takes time, and as I mentioned earlier, what 
we've certainly learned is it doesn't necessarily have as a, as a tangible aim as other projects uh, have in terms of simplification, because we know ultimately where, where it's going to go. There's so many variables that are playing part here and humans are, I won't speak for you lovely people, but we have, as, we find it hard to let go of stuff. We really do. Um, we find it very hard. And I think when biodiversity comes into play in terms of looking after biodiversity, we want to meddle, we want to get involved. But I think likes of um, Napa State's recent success story of let go. And the more you let go, not that they let go fully, but that's a great example of what you can do with understanding ecosystem processes, being aware of the importance of biodiversity, and then looking at the success story of those species that are coming back. But ultimately where we're wanting to be is being able across the landscape to rank various compartments of biodiversity importance to allow conservation planning to take place. And similarly identifying where restoration would be best prioritized. So moving from species lists, bubble pots and decision trees, NMDS pots to something tangible, i.e. space and time with respect to, to intervention. And that's ultimately where we get really excited and sorry to go off on a little bit of a tangent, but my daughter was asking me um, about biodiversity a couple of weeks ago and I was explaining it to her and you can tell me whether I did a really poor job or not. Um, I heard her talking to, to one of her friends and we're big foodies in, in, in our house. We like our, we like our food, like good food. And everything is an analogy back to food. And I overheard her talking to her friend who says, oh, so what is it that your dad does? My dad saves the earth. I was like, I, I, I can, I, I, I'm down with that. I, I like that statement. Yeah, but what does he do? He said biodiversity. Why is that important? He says, well, what's your favourite dinner? It's a roast dinner. Okay, well, just imagine that your roast dinner consists of peas and nothing else. And at that point, I was like, is, is, do I jump in? Do I intervene? Is this just weird? If that she's only 10. I'm going to go along with that. I like it. It's good. We'll just leave that there. It's obviously far deeper, but... It's very rare that nature creates a monoculture and there's a big reason for that. And ultimately where we're wanting to go is to give people the power to understand what is a degraded system and how they get to, to a healthy one. And that does require a little bit, dare I say, of, of, of absence, but it's understanding how much absence that we, we need to play. Um, oh, hang on one second, sorry. So another couple of examples, which I think lend itself to being really cool in terms of the DNA collection here. We did some work with uh, Aquabiota and I won't go into this because there's 30 years worth of data here, but, and then two days worth of the DNA sampling. But as you can see, there's so much in terms of application here. I mean, you've got a couple of examples well, I'm just going to go through the one here, for, which is based in Sweden. So comparing eDNA against 30 years of classic invasive electrofishing and netting, consensus here generally is that eDNA outperforms most types of traditional methods. And you can see that the number missed by traditional methods is given a better breadth of species and understanding of species richness and composition across those landscapes. So marine environments, lots of interest in blue carbon, nature-based solution projects, and we're currently working with the uh, UNEP, uh, coming back to Inger Anderson, um, on the Global uh, Carbon Refund Monitoring Project as well. So I just thought it was a really exciting um, prospect that we have going on there. But, got to be my second favourite place on planet Earth, the Amazon. So this programme, this project, I think was just a highlight of what the kits can do in terms of um, upscaling uh, data. So this project was ultimately um, set up with the WWF and um, they were looking predominantly at two key uh, red list species. So it was the Pink River uh, Dolphin and the Amazon Manatee. And they wanted to know if eDNA could be used to do this. So I think they initially had in mind that they wanted to use 
single species analysis. So if they did that, if we did that, you would only be detecting manatees and pink river dolphins or nothing at all. But we didn't. We suggested that we should try eDNA metabarcoding for vertebrates instead, um, as this would provide data on other species at the same time. You know, it's, it's, it's the Amazon. I'm assuming some people here have been there. We know how varied it is and how beautiful and magical it is and the variety of species close to second to none. So dolphin highlighting abundance here, high replicates. This is a way to look at occurrence of species across a landscape. And if you repeated this, you can see if the numbers are going down, if they are steady or growing and getting an idea of how their population is, is varying. Manatee in, in the green protected sites, the population is quite localized in the stretch of river between two protected sites, which was really important for the WWF to, to acknowledge and understand um, in terms of preserving that area for, for, for them. They put limits on speedboats in terms of actually being there in the first place. They put speed limits there to prevent injuries. So there's things like that, that in terms of management practices that can be put in. So ecotourism can still thrive, but so can the species. I mean, that's a difficult combination of two. Ecotourism can thrive and so can species. I'll, I might leave that one open to interpretation, but what happened here is that because of this data, they were able to instill some management practices to help moving towards species protection. As we said, the focus here is two species, but in terms of the vertebrate uh, primer that we use, we targeted quite a lot. So we picked up 675 vertebrate species. So everyone's got a real high point success story. This is definitely one of them. Admittedly, 375 were certain fish species, um, but there were 155 mammals tapirs to giant river otters, primates, aces, jaguars, amphibians, reptiles even, even though their low meta metabolic rates are difficult to, to detect, still got them, and even birds um, are harder still, um, but they're nice, nice complementary data. And why, whilst we, we are trying to use machine learning, looking at landscapes and the differences of species, communities from one another, i.e., for example, we were able to ID a different set of fish species found at the site. So there was a waterfall and barrier, which is creating a divide. So if you like, and but this information helps management to decide on how and where to protect some of the more isolated groups, especially from things such as pollution. So interesting applications can be developed um, from here. And that's all because we opted not to use a single species and we use the vertebrate assay for multi-species. So don't want to target two single species because that's all we're going to get. Or we're going to get nothing. Let's look at the whole story here. Um, and yeah, we've got 675 instead, along with obviously the pink river dolphin and, and the manatee. So certainly a huge um, upscale of data in terms of example there, which I think is so important to try and understand. And obviously something that we are developing all the time. Uh, R and D department is uh, certainly active with um, calling the, the the drones in terms of what they're getting up to, but in terms of assay development, we've got some very exciting times ahead. And I think if you were to liken us as a retail shop, not yeah yeah I'll go with it, a retail shop, the customers that are coming in, you ask certain questions, can we perform? single species analysis for this species or that species no not quite yet let's see if we can let's see if we can so off the shelf things we, we're doing at the moment especially for like crayfish crayfish bay single crayfish white pool crayfish um and then we're adding some very exciting new species which i can't quite say just yet um but that that is coming but to sum up edna meta barcoding it's accurate it's repeatable, it's efficient sampling, it's big data that can augment conventional surveys and anybody can get the data, democratizing it, reduce costs and timeframes and developing reference libraries. Libraries. Ultimately, where we're wanting to go is understanding the so what factor. Yes, we've been able to find these species within that habitat, but so what? What does finding fungal uh, species actually mean? Well. Finding the fungal network um, within soil gives us an indication of, of a, he a healthy soil. That's where we want to move, move to. Um, 
that gives us and our clients a, a lot of move in regards to how we go about restoring. But it's it's a waiting game. You're talking years rather than days and months. Um, but ultimately, where we've come from and where where we're going, it's a very very big scale and. I think the, one of the most final points, as you may or may not have seen in the Guardian a couple of months ago, we partnered with the IUCN in terms of uh, eBioAtlas, so that is uh, predominantly freshwater um, analysis of 30,000 rivers across the globe, um, but all that data is going to uh, be publicised and for people to add on to it to augment data and ultimately to look after biodiversity not that I think you should remember the analogy that my daughter gave me but there's some likeness there in terms of why why we should care and then going back to the first point that I was mentioning that we've all chosen a path that's led to some form of connection with with nature you've heard a little bit about my story um it's just where does your story fit into it and how does it um transfer in terms of what you can and can't do regarding nature um i think that's sort of me summing up in terms of questions and things uh there, there's there's my email um feel free to, to set email questions uh later on and throughout if you want to get in touch and talk about um any any projects um but other than that thank you very much for listening ian thank you um that's a, a wonderful illustration of what is clearly a highly technical, fast developing subject. But uh, I think the place I might need to disagree with you, I'm just in awe of your daughter's explanation of biodiversity. I think she's, she's the next science communicator in the making. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, when she said it, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Like, oh, actually, yeah, you know, I'll let you have I that. do a lot worse that. than that. That, that, that's, anyway, all right. that's all right it's simple it's, it's yeah, simple it's yeah. uh, an, an effective so people have submitted a few questions which i'll run through there's room for a few more but we do have a good good few already okay. um the first of which is um how effective is edna for sort of plant habitat studies uh, plant habitat studies well plant or habitat studies so yes. you've talked a lot about you know so yes. So, and so on bacteria yeah, so as i said mother taught me that honesty and transparency is the best policy we're not currently focusing on on plant uh habitat surveys um currently it is something that is earmarked for next year um as i said it's one of the applications that rnd are currently looking at at the moment but no it's not something that we're currently um offering uh, to this point i never like answering a question with no and moving i'm on. sorry i started with that one now I shouldn't really no no it's okay but it is something that we are getting asked and the more that we're asked the more that we see that there is a need need for this but um again this it is something that we will start off in terms of what i can say it'll be down to it'll be community level um wouldn't be necessarily focusing right down to, to, to species but um it's something where we're starting to apply some applications because we know it's something that we we need to do um, we're just running, running, running the systems at the moment in terms of how we get there. Sure, thank you. And uh, Adrian, I, I think missed parts because of internet problems. So I think it's just to confirm that you can do UK metrics on the soil biome and microinvertebrates as well as the macro, like water voles, beavers, and so on. I think you covered that. Yes, yeah, so uh, our metrics at the moment are predominantly focused within the within the soil. So in terms of bacteria, fungal ratios, that is where we're focusing at the moment. So we're assessing change over time. I think focus is there, not necessarily with um, mammal mammal assays uh, per se. So the focus at the moment in terms of metrics is predominantly focused within soils. Okay, thank you. And really, with a, a kind of a what we can do in Yorkshire focus as well as the rest of the world. Um, about how we can monitor the benefits of regenerative agriculture for wildlife, as well as for climate and for ourselves in nutrition terms, and particularly sort of how that interlinks with soil organic carbon as a useful metric. Yeah, so this is something that we have the biodiversity, the biodiversity, uh, sorry, uh, business intelligence team is currently looking at. There's, um, there's an estate up close near Yorkshire that we're working with at the moment where um, 
it's a very beautiful estate. Um, can't say too much more than that. Um, where we're, we're looking into this, um, we're tying in not just um, soil fauna, metazoa, fungi. We're also looking at abiotic factors as well. And I think in regards to to peat, and then accrediting that with um, uh, carbon credits, for example, is is the next is the next move. So algorithmic learning, machine learning. This is ultimately where. It's, it's heading in terms of credit assignment, um, but that is a bit out of my scope in terms of answering, but I know it's, it's just around the corner, should I say, in terms of um, application. Um, we have a team that's, that's working with that and on that at the moment. Okay, and um, from Jeff Roberts. Good evening, Jeff. Good to uh, see that you're on, and I will reply to your email from this morning tomorrow. Um, Jeff's asking about the challenges of estimating abundance. I know you touched on that. But... Yeah, so I think one of the things that we, we shouldn't get too caught up on is that it's not necessarily our bioinformatics statisticians, and I don't say that it's purely for relative abundance it can be used i think as, as a proxy for abundance and high temporal resolution so i think that's probably the best and fairest way to assess it and with that you need good data sets replicable uh, sorry replicable data sets so it's, it's good for a proxy for abundance but then you know that's one of the probably say limitations when you're doing electrofishing for example that does give you health checks assessment number and good for a relative abundance this is used i'd say as a proxy for abundance um, I think it's probably the best, the fairest statement to leave there. Oh, that's helpful, thank you. Um, clearly rewilding is taking place on different scales, different places. Do you have any examples of small and larger scale rewilding sites that have done eDNA surveys, sort of what drove them to use them and, and how they're using the results? Uh, yes, without, without naming names, so forgive me as I've been here, being a for four months, we do have smaller scales. So where you're talking um, 20 to 40 hectares, right up from 40 hectares to 800 hectares, uh, for, for example. So yes, we do have small scale. Um, for me, I think that always tends to be quite exciting because the move forward tends to be a bit quicker because as I was saying before, in terms of running the operation of samples and appeasing the god of statistics and getting three samples you you know the cost factor can can go up quite considerably when you're branching the the, the hectareage but when you're working on close proximities pretty sure the ratio is similar but budgets are slightly down um we can start to see a trans a transference of these smaller projects actually taking on the rewilding programs but this is all at the junior stage for us we don't have five years of back data to say we started five years ago we, we started a year ago and this is where we're at in terms of the health metrics in terms of the soil we know that it's going to be focused in terms of uh, bacteria and fungal ratio and then the time man management through measurement through through change so just within that period of being proficient in great crested newts and rivers and catchments to focusing purely on soil there's been such a move and such a uh, drive for, for nature metrics in terms of moving forward on the soil front that with every person we've added to nature metrics, we've probably had 10 inquiries in terms of uh, that, that profile. So I can't necessarily name names, but we, what we're noticing is that the detail comes within the sampling strategy. So it's all well and good to say, I want to do a rewilding project. So that's great, but could we understand this from a phase one habitat survey? Could we look at the parcels and the plots? What is it? What are the treatments? What are the land usages? How can this directly be compared and contrasted? So there's a lot of questions that go into rewilding and rightly so. It's, it's not something that you can just run out and say, yeah, we'll just go and do some kit analysis for you and give you some data in eight weeks. It's, it's we're far more invested in that, uh, the side than that. And I think the more invested you become, the more questions that we ask, the better the long-term outcome is. But we're, you know, I'm, I'm sat here and we, we haven't got to the long-term outcomes yet because we've, we've only really, in the grand scheme of things, just started. And thank you. And um, as you discuss results with clients um, and are interpreting the results, does there tend to be as much focus on kind of what you might have expected to find but didn't find in eDNA results? Can be, um, 
just because um, we didn't detect something doesn't necessarily mean it's it wasn't there. And I think that's one of the things that over the five, six years of Nature Metrics Live history is that we've had to try and position in terms of what the kits can detect, can't detect. So that's something that is quite proficient and how we position ourselves in terms of answering those questions. But I think in terms of, of, of moving forward, the results that we've we found are always super exciting in regards to what the client thought they were going to get because most of the time we're comparing this data against electrofishing data ea data that they've already got and i might be not i, I like to think statistically wise but i'd like to say eight times out of ten we're always finding species that weren't necessarily on the list, but they thought originally should have been on the list that the electrode fishing didn't, didn't detect. So that's the beautiful thing about, about the eDNA, you can find those cryptic and elusive species mm. as well quite easily and very non-invasively. Thank you. And the final question before I sum up is, uh, where can people get an idea of the costs involved? And do people tend to manage to find grants or other funding to support yeah, the DNA? Yeah, there's plenty surveys. of funding that are out there. And one of the things, again, um, I come from an NGO background, a B Corp background that puts people, planet in place before profit. So I decide in terms of where I, I work with, with quite a lot of consideration. And uh, Nature Metrics has a NGO and academic um price list should I say so it's not the commercial price list so academics NGOs trusts are offered a reduced rate um, the citizen science project um, even further in terms of reduced rate um, that's us wanting to promote and augment data um, on a social scale so people and more people can get involved this will be the trusts the NGOs um, National Trust, River Trust do so much good work that we want to try and promote them as best as we possibly can to with those reduced rates um, but yeah, if you just get in, get in touch with us, with, with myself, and if you're wanting to, whether you've got a small project, as I said, we talk and work with people who want to assess their back garden and ponds to talking with big NGOs that are running um, collaboration schemes with indigenous people on the Amazon River, for example, um, talking one kit to a thousand kits and everything in between. So yeah, if you have an interest in something, please just come say hello and then we can talk about what it is that you're after and hopefully we can we can provide the answers in terms of what you're trying to do thank you i, I think that's all the questions we've got time for um at this point i always uh, thank ian for speaking and thank john for uh, setting all this up never more so than this evening um ian is uh, just on the back of a case of covid so um thanks for battling through and uh, not really letting that show and i hope you don't mind me telling people no that's too late fine. now if you do Nice. Um, and John, thank you for covering admirably. My laptop froze and went blank just as I started the webinar. So you probably saw a bit of background that I couldn't turn video off and so on. But uh, I think John rescued the situation till I got back on, as, as far as I can tell. Um, so just before we conclude, I'll um, just share when we have the next couple of webinars in our series. So Tuesday, the 16th of November, Terry Wilson from the Wildlife and Conservation Team in the Yorkshire Dales National Park will talk about how farmers are managing their land, particularly with biodiversity and, uh, and the economics as well um, in their thoughts. And then on Tuesday, the 7th of December, Tim Mackerel will do a piece about the sea eagle reintroductions. He's been involved in several reintroductions and has promised to uh, include reference to the, uh, the couple of juvenile sea eagles which sent, spent much of last year having travelled from the Isle of Wight to uh, Whitby. So um, details of those will be on our website nearer the time and uh, keep an eye on that to register. Final plea then, we do as John uh, mentioned really need uh, funds to keep ourselves going so please if you've enjoyed this evening look on our website at the donate page or look to join our Wild 100 Club, which is uh, our current push to, uh, to make our funding sustainable. But with that, I'll bid you all good evening and um, thanks for joining this evening. Bye now. <laughs>